Hello and welcome to YOLO, You Only Look Once. YOLO basically is one of the most powerful algorithms in uh, computer vision to detect different kind of objects in images. Um, and it turns out that both in terms of efficiency as well as um, accuracy, YOLO actually, um, actually stays at the top. Although in terms of accuracy, there are certain algorithms that are comparative with uh, YOLO, like RCNNs. Um, but when it comes really towards the combination of both speed, efficiency, and uh, I mean efficiency and accuracy, YOLO actually stays at the top. Um, but at the end of the day, it's an algorithm that actually detects um, and classifies, actually localizes different kind of objects in an image very, very efficiently. So before actually diving into the details of uh, how YOLO works, let's see what do we mean by object detection in, in, in general and how um, the object detection, uh, what are the object detection techniques uh, in general. So <clears throat> object detection, sometimes also known as object recognition, localization, there are multiple phases, um, kind of synonyms, but uh, it, is, it is good to uh, it is good to differentiate detection versus recognition versus localization. Here in this particular image, actually, it is detection as well as recognition as well as localization. When we say localization, localization of an object means finding out the, finding out the uh, area uh, in the image where the object lies. For example, um, this bounding box, uh, presence of this bounding box actually means uh, this particular bottle has been localized. So localization really means, um, uh, I mean, localizing the object uh, inside the image, uh, finding out its bounding box or whatever the bounding shape you came up with may not be a box, but normally it's a box uh, coming up with a with a boundary of the um, of the object, uh, some representation that tells the location of the object inside the inside the large image. So that's called localization. Detection sometimes um, uh, re detection sometimes is referred to as finding out whether there exists a part whether there exists some object in the image or not. So, for example, uh, this partic this is some object that exists in this image. So that is called detection. The object is detected, and then object recognition, or sometimes called the classification, means to find out the category of that object. So okay, you have found an object in the image, but what is the identity of that object? Um, when, when in computer vision literature and in image processing literature, when people talk about object detection, um, one way or the other, um, and in most of the cases, they are actually referring to all these three phases uh, in which the object is detected, it is uh, recognized or classified, and also it is localized. Um, so all these three, although the three problems are complicated when they come up in uh, combination, um, but when, when normally people talk about object detection, uh, in most of the cases, they are referring to the three phases. You have to uh, detect the object, whether there is an object in the image or not. If there is an object in the image, what is that object and where the object is in the image? All these three phases sometimes is referred to as object detection, although a better way is to uh, represent detection uh, as well as uh, localization as well as uh, recognition. So maybe differentiating the terms differently might be uh, more bad. I mean, might be great. Um, but uh, the point of the story is when we talk about object detection, we really means mostly um, detection, recognition, and localization. And it turns out this problem in, in these kind of three combinations is, is not easy. Um, it's hard when it, when it comes to uh, real images um, because one image can contain a lot of objects. The objects may be overlapping, um, may be occluded by the other, maybe only parts of the objects are visible. The objects may appear in different sizes, different rotations, and anywhere in the images. Um, and and I, I mean, um, there are a lot of challenges in finding out all the available objects in the image when the objects have a lot of variations uh, and there is a background clutter as well. So let's discuss um, 
some of the classic techniques or more generic techniques how to actually classify an object. So consider for example um, this image that contains a cat and also assume that we have a set of predefined classes. Let's say class 1 refers to as cat, let's say class 2 refers to as dog, let's say class 3 refers to as maybe person, let's say class 4 refers to as maybe a car or vehicle, and let's say class 5 refers to as none of the above or maybe a background. So let's say for now we have only five classes and let's say these are the classes. And uh, we are given a large image like so. We are given a large image and we want to find out the objects. We actually, found, we actually want to f uh, find out which object is where uh, in, in this uh, large image. So consider for example a patch uh, in the image. Uh, let's say a patch of let's say 100 by 100 just just assume in this case by the way it is one two three four five one two three four five let's say it's a five by five patch all it's unrealistic size for images but let's just assume for example it's a five by five patch and let's say this is the corresponding five by five rgb uh, cropped image let's say this is the cropped version of the image um, and we want to know uh, whether this particular patch is a particular object out of these objects or not so let's say we have uh, a lot of training data in which we have a lot of five cross five, five by five images, and we have some classifier that is trained on uh, these fixed sized images, a lot of these. And assume we are uh, using some feature extractor, maybe a hog or LBP, or there are several feature extractors. Let's, let's use some of the, let's use some feature uh, vector, feature extractor to represent this image um, uh, maybe we maybe you maybe we use raw intensity values to represent that image. That is uh, that is not a great idea in most of the cases, but one way or the other, that's also a feature vector. So um, we have uh, let's say a lot of five by five images that is called training data. Those images are labeled, and we trained our classifier. Uh, we also choose some feature extractor. We extract the features and each image then will be represented by a vector of numbers and then our classifier actually classifies um, it, that particular image is of what kind of category uh, either it's a cat dog person car or none of these um, once the uh, object category or the class is found then localization is uh, can be carried out uh, by the controls that from where we have cropped this patch and that way, at this particular location, we can draw a five by five box saying that this particular, uh, this is basically, let's say, a cat. Then, uh, because this image is really larger, uh, what we can do is we should search a five by five patch everywhere in this image, um, sometimes known as the sliding window, which just says uh, if you have seen the object, if you have searched for the object here, Next, we may search for here. Next, we may search for any object here and so on. Um, and it turns out this sliding window operation is, uh, is really expensive um, because uh, maybe you are moving pixel by pixel or maybe you have used a stride of maybe one or two or three or maybe five pixels, maybe more than that. But even then, um, sliding over a window in a, and cropping the fixed size patches and then extracting the features for every patch and then classifying that, um, that sliding window kind of operation may be expensive. Uh, it turns out, uh, particularly in convolutional neural networks, the sliding window kind of um, operation can be implemented way efficiently than, than, actually, uh, than actually treating each uh, cropped image independently. It, for example, if we have uh, our original image, training image, as the size of this blue box and let's say our sliding step in both x and y directions is two pixels uh, then you can see uh, one feature we, we demand one feature vector for this blue window and uh, we basically want after after a step of two we want one feature vector corresponding to this patch and then we move two pixel down and we actually demand 
is this green box, one feature vector corresponding to it. And similarly, we can shift uh, right two pixels. And so there are four uh, feature vectors that should be computed uh, with, the, with the sliding window effect by assuming that there is a sliding step of two pixels. It turns out if we implement this using uh, convolutional neural networks, then uh, even a single pass of the network can give us all four feature vectors. Um, here, um, although the drawn uh, variance of the ConfNet just is showing you the first phase, actually if you see this number, this actually is a volume here going this way. If you see this number, this is actually a volume. So um, it turns out that um, using convolutional neural networks can improve the efficiency of this uh, ordinary sliding window operation um, because there are a lot of uh, computations that are repetitive. repetitive. Um, you are doing it again and again uh, across different uh, slided uh, patches. And in convolutional neural networks, those can be uh, redoings can be avoided. So um, yes, we should use convolutional neural network if we are basically deciding if, if at least one aspect is the sliding window aspect. Although there are other, actually the, the actual reasons of using convolutional neural networks is not just the sliding window. Um, that's basically automatic feature learning. But it turns out that uh, sliding window implementation through convolutional neural networks is just an add-on. It, it's just a much more efficient than ordinary uh, sliding window operation. Um, so, uh, so far what we have seen is um, if the object is anywhere in the image, which is we can detect the object. So for example, as long as the object is, um, the, the size of the object is basically the size compatible with our uh, window, um, window, which is the, the size of the training image as well, wherever the object lies, this sliding window will actually capture that object. And this kind of phenomena is sometimes known as shift invariance. So the sliding window operation or sliding window type object detectors, they are really shift invariant no matter where the object is in the image, they will eventually find those out. Um, but there are a couple of other problems that are really serious problems. One is what if the um, size of the object is bigger than the predefined window size or significantly smaller than. So let's say the actual object does not fit into, into the predefined window. Um, for example, in our case, our pre predefined window is five by five. Let's say uh, the object in the real image does not fit in that. By not fitting, I mean either the object is too large, which goes outside this uh, window, or it is too small and uh, the actual the actual window contain a lot of uh, garbage outside other than this object as well. In both of these cases, the, um, the, the technique using the sliding window and uh, classifying each window independently will fail badly. So we need to come up with, and, and this is, uh, right now I'm just talking about the scale. Uh, the same problem goes for the rotation. What if the um, what if the object appears in a rotated version and the training uh, images do not care, care about that? So really, uh, the scale and rotation problems, and particularly the scale problem, is, is not easy to handle using sliding window. One way is uh, that you come up with your test image and um, you actually slide it with one window size and then you change the window size and then repeat the process, then you change the window size and repeat the process and somehow make uh, pyramids of uh, results for different window sizes and then uh, choose the maximum or the most probable one for different sizes. Um, actually, this, uh, this ki these kind of solutions to handle uh, the detection at different scales, they actually uh, remain very classical and very promising until um, the arrival of more sophisticated techniques in convolutional neural networks where one we are going to discuss here, that why don't you learn the scale and rotation from the data? So let's say you have data, a lot of images, each image uh, contain different kind of objects, and uh, the images actually contain the objects of smaller size and larger size and so on. Let's say the image size is fixed, um, 
um, let's say whatever um, a by b let's do the size of the image is fixed but inside uh, the image different kind of objects of different categories they can ha they can have of different sizes and then let a convolutional neural network learn the si scales and rotations and detect the object of whatever size and of whatever rotation the object appears in as long as your training data contain a lot of diversity of scales and rotations um, it will eventually uh, detect the object um, these convolutional neural networks very cool um, all we have to do is to set up a problem uh, to to set up our training data in the form that a convolutional neural network basically accepts so for now let's say we have uh, four classes class one is pedestrian class two is car class three is motorcycle and class four is background let's say so for each image we uh, the the training data of the each image contains the training image itself and the target label for that contains basically um, the basically the object for example the object might be in this particular case the object is two and then the bounding box um, the location of the tight bounding box of the object which is bx by um, bh and bw um, so that's the target for this image so for every training image we have the corresponding target and we have to train a convolutional neural network that actually uh, minimizes the loss and uh, at the test time if an image appears actually it generates for that particular image not only the label of the object but also the bounding box great let's see how um, how can we actually model this target label more precisely uh, it turns out that um, to to generate a target vector a better way is to first denote a component sometimes called pc or uh, probability of the class or sometimes the presence of class uh, and, the, and, and PC value will be zero in case the image does not contain any object from the predefined objects uh, from the predefined categories or the, the PC contains zero in case of the background class um, and then uh, the bounding box BX is basically so each image is rescaled from zero to one so the uh, height of the image is considered to be 1 and the width of the image is considered to be 1 so the top corner is 0 0 and the bottom bottom right corner is 1 1 and all the measurements they are made in this particular space normalized space now this bx and by they actually define the center of the um, of the bounding box and this center is with respect to this 0 0 where is that so for example in this particular case bx might be if this is our x-axis and this is our y-axis then bx might be somewhere uh, as 0.5 uh, and by might be for example 0 0.7 maybe and then um, the width basically is uh, relative to the height and uh, width of the image the width and height might be both let's say zero, the height might be let's say 0 0.4 and width might be 0 0.35 and then which class is this as in previous um, slide we saw uh, we have four classes one two three and four so class two uh, is basically so class two is one this is zero and this is zero so this is one hot encoding of the classes so that's the target vector we generate for this and it turns out this kind of target vector with PC and then bounding box and then one hot encoding for classes it works really well for these kind of um, tasks and the loss function can be defined piecewise for different kind of coordinates in this target vector so far so good but the problem is uh, the the way we have looked at the problem uh, it is only true if an image contains only one object at most one object what if the image contains more than uh, one object a single image it contains multiple objects the way we have uh, generated our training data and set up all our problem actually relies on the fact that each image contains at most one object um, but for multiple objects we need to do something else um, the the way we saw a single object uh, how to actually learn scale and rotations and all the positions for a single object 
uh, somehow we have to generalize it to handle multiple objects as well. And they here, exactly here, the idea of YOLO comes in, which is really powerful. So let's see how YOLO actually treats the whole problem of detecting multiple objects. The objects can have multiple objects in a single image um, and different objects, they can have different sizes, different rotations, different positions in the image, they may be overlapping and all, all these kind of complications. Um, this YOLO actually handle it just once uh, and very quickly. So let's see the pieces of YOLO that actually builds upon this particular idea that we have seen here exactly in this slide. So let's go. The idea of YOLO is rather than treating the whole image just as an image, uh, let's divide the image into a grid where um, in this particular case the grid is three by three. So we have nine sub images here and um, the and each um, each cell here can be treated as um, treated as a separate image. Here, what they do is basically so consider this is a um, training image, um, and let's generate the target for this particular image, which may contain multiple objects. Here again, the assumption is each cell contains at max one object, um, and that's basically the idea of con dividing the image into grids so that um, each cell in the grid actually contain fewer number of objects to the level that it contains at max one object. Uh, if this is not the case, we can, uh, we can generate more number of cells in X and Y directions uh, for forcing this kind of constraint. So rem remember this assumption that right now we are, we are actually dividing our image into grid and each cell of the grid is assumed to contain at max one object. Um, now, uh, if this is our training image, this cell will be this cell will be having a target. This cell will be having a target. This cell will be having a target, and so on. So there are nine cells. Each cell will be having a target. So let's see how the target is defined. Each cell is, uh, for example, let's see the very first cell. Each cell is considered to be zero by zero to. Each cell is considered to be a normalized image from zero to one. And in this particular case, because this cell contains nothing, so the target vector for this particular cell is uh, PC is zero, and all other values are don't cares. Whatever those values are, I mean, nobody, nobody cares about those values because there does not exist a class. The loss function only relies on uh, the existence of class. Same goes for this, for that, uh, for this. Let's go for this. Um, although you can see uh, here in this particular cell, let me use a different color here. In this particular cell, you might be seeing that there is uh, a portion of an interesting object. We will call a cell containing an object if the centroid of the object lies in that cell and uh, multiple centroids in a single cell are not allowed uh, because the basic assumption is each cell contains at max one object. So if we see this object, the centroid of this object might be here, and the centroid is in this particular cell, uh, in this cell, and, and so we will say only this cell contains uh, this particular object. Now, um, because this cell is also zero to one normalized image, um, we will find out, we will actually denote the center of this object, which is this car, uh, the object as uh, bx, by, bc is one, bx is some value uh, in in this in this in this center cell. By is some value in this center cell. Um, it is important to note that although bx and by they are always between uh, zero and one because they have to stay in the normal normalized um, image, it, it, they, they will be in some cell and every cell has extends from zero to one. But BH, uh, which is the uh, B, B width, which is width and height, they may not be between zero to one. For example, if you see the scale of zero to one of this cell, the width is larger than one. And the height may also here look like larger than one. So although um, the uh, the centroid is between zero and one, the width and height relative to the scale of the cell may be larger than one. 
So uh, we mark this and uh, the class here, class one is zero, class two is one, class three is zero. So that's the target vector for this cell, this particular cell. Similarly, we have a target vector for this cell and we will annotate this particular box. Now, uh, for different kind of objects, we have target cells. Uh, we have targets here, we have uh, this image actually has nine targets. Um, each target has, in this particular case, been, have eight numbers. So the target for this particular image, if we divide the image into nine cells, the, this, the, it is basically eight by nine matrix, uh, where we are considering every column of the matrix is a target vector with some ordering of these kind of cells. Now uh, our convolutional neural network will take an image and the corresponding target tensor or target structure and minimizes the loss. Cool, uh, it will detect. Now each image, by the way, will contain only one object and we can force that by making the grid more refined. Um, and that way you will, you will, just, you will just keep uh, each and every cell independently, although the convolutional neural network just goes once over the image, uh, you treat each cell independently as, uh, as, a, as a task where each image contain only one object, like, like the way we saw here in this particular slide. Um, it turns out in most of the cases, it turns out that it may be the case that multiple objects, they indeed lie in a single, um, in single cell. And it is also the case that different kind of interesting objects, they have different kind of predefined shapes. These predefined shapes are sometimes known as anchor boxes. For example, it is, um, it is, it is reasonable to think that vehicles mostly, they will lie in, um, in these kind of shapes and persons, uh, they will mostly lie in these kind of shapes. So why don't we, uh, why don't we learn shape-specific features, shape-specific object detectors. So the idea for anchor boxes is, let's say you define two kind of anchor box, anchor box one, which, ha which is this horizontal rectangle, anchor box two, which is this rectangle, and just build your target with respect to each anchor box, um, whether, so, so here we are just assuming that um, each cell can contain multiple objects, um, but uh, the two objects may have different anchor boxes. Uh, so each cell cannot contain multiple objects of the same anchor box. Uh, and, and then you can, you can increase the number of anchor boxes for, for, for more refinement. Let me give you an example of how this first uh, cell will be annotated. The first cell, PC1, PC1 means the, the attributes of the target with respect to anchor box one is zero. Um, then we don't care, don't care, all the don't cares. Then PC2, the object with respect to this particular anchor box is also zero in this particular case, and all others are don't care. If you have only two anchor boxes and three interesting classes along with a background as a fourth class, then this target vector for this particular cell will now be having 16 coordinates. Now, how this particular cell will be uh, how the target for this particular cell will be generated. It turns out that the, the target for the car will be having eight numbers, just as before, because that's the anchor box one. And then anchor box two, if our positioning is that always the anchor box one appears first, then anchor box two will contain all the uh, target starting from the PC value independently for this particular person. And uh, that's the target for this particular cell. Um, and in this particular case, our, our each cell contains, each cell will be, uh, we have nine cells and the total targets will be 16 by nine, where the 16 is due to there are only two anchor boxes. If there are multiple anchor boxes, uh, let's say three or four, then these number of coordinates will increase. Now, if you, if you have complicated shapes and more variety of anchor boxes, you can detect multiple occluded overlapping objects just in one go using the early idea of YOLO. So in, uh, let, me expl let me summarize the uh, YOLO algorithm. Let's say you have training images. Let's say I1, I2. Let's say you have a lot of training images. 
let's say n of those so step one uh, pick every training image and make a grid of the training image let's say you make a k by k grid uh, let's say and choose the uh, anchor boxes so let's say you have uh, these kind of anchor boxes let's say maybe several ones so anchor box one two and let's say you have p anchor boxes let's say just in a general setting um, and then let's say the total number of categories in your uh, class including the uh, excluding the background excluding the background class the done of let's say the total number of cl classes are just um, let's say c c is the total number of classes number of classes excluding the background now what will happen is each image uh, the target for each image is the following uh, we have uh, k by k we have k square cells for each image uh, and uh, for each cell we have p anchor boxes which means the target might be uh, p into um, the total number of so always there are five numbers p c b x b y b width and b height these five numbers are already there and then we have total number of classes here so p into uh, c plus five so that will be the kind of a shape of the target for one image so now then you go and generate a target for image two and so on and then give these images let's say this is i and this is y i so give these images as well as their targets to a confnet and you're just good to go you have implemented yolo how cool is that one problem however that is mostly there in most of the computer vision tasks is non maxima suppression which is uh, what if uh, in the close by or nearby locations there are a lot of false alarms uh, or a lot of candidate alarms um, but what actually happens is the all, most of these alarms are just false alarms or maybe one candidate alarm can be chosen that is the most appropriate um, in the context of YOLO this can happen if we make the grids grid very large uh, thereby thereby reducing the cell size very small just to just to force the constraint that each cell must contain um, exactly one object of one anchor box type um, then what will happen is the nearby cells they may contain a significant portion of the object and e the nearby cells they may also alarm that they also contain the object uh, which may result in a lot of uh, false alarms and we want to suppress these alarms and pick the most appropriate one um, so these kind of operations that pick the most appropriate kind of uh, alarms in these kind of situations is known as non maxima suppression. What happens is you fix a category, let's say class I, and you fix anchor box, let's say anchor box as J, and you, you actually see all the, cat, all the uh, alarms for a particular category for a particular anchor box that has an overlapping ratio overlapping ratio more than a certain threshold sometimes this overlapping ratio is defined by um, um, area um, intersection over union sometimes called intersection over union uh, if this particular overlap if this particular cr criteria is larger than a particular threshold then we pick the one that is larger than uh, that has the probability larger than uh, the other or, or we really suppress the suppress all of those that are that has that are overlapping, and we just pick the one that has maximum probability value, thereby reducing a lot of uh, alarms that are inappropriate nearby, and we do this for each category and for each anchor box. So that's about the complete information about yellow or YOLO. You only look once the state of the art detector. Um, it, is, uh, it has implementations available in TensorFlow as well as in uh, other deep learning frameworks as well. Um, it has multiple versions and they are pretty cool. Uh, Pre-trained models are also there. Um, one should really try. Um, I hope you like our video. If, if that's really the case, please uh, press the like button, subscribe our channel and uh, share this video to your fellows. 
Hope to see you next time.